Gibir Otai Barabatai Toharaim Tovim Barachim Habaim Lesichadzo Al Madashel HaKorona. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this talk, the series of talks on how science is helping us move on from coronavirus. My name is Stephen Wilson and I'm the Chief Executive of the United Synagogue, an organization of some 60 synagogues uh, in England, the largest of its kind in Europe. Welcome to um, all of our viewers uh, in the UK and in Israel and from throughout the world, whether you are joining us on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, or via our brand new television station, um, the US.TV. Uh, for me, it's a particularly uh, personal pleasure that we're able to uh, do this event jointly with the Weizmann Institute. Whilst today I'm the Chief Executive of the United Synagogue and have been for the last six years, my background is in science, and it kicked off really at the uh, Weizmann Institute, which, uh, which set me on my uh, scientific path. I'm particularly grateful to my friends, Professor Ron uh, Naaman and Professor Inon Rudich. Uh, so if our colleagues from the Weizmann Institute are in touch with them, please send them my, my best wishes. We're also particularly pleased today to be partnering with Weizmann UK for today's event so that we can bring leading scientists from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel to share with us their insights of, of uh, the, how science holds the key for us to uh, understand all aspects of coronavirus, uh, from treatment to tracing, and allow us to move on from the chaos caused by COVID-19. With the world in uh, the grip of a deadly pandemic and a prolonged lockdown taking its toll on just about every part of our uh, lives, from uh, the economy to education, all eyes have been looking to the scientific community uh, for answers to some very difficult questions. The Weizmann Institute is a world leader in multidisciplinary scientific research. It's risen to the challenge posed by COVID-19 and is currently working on more than 50 projects related to coronavirus. Please allow me to introduce our three speakers this afternoon. Uh, first of all, Professor Roy Ozeri, who is the Vice President for Resource Development at the Institute, will discuss how the Weizmann has been fighting the virus, pivoting and adjusting its research agenda in the early days of the pandemic to focus on the virus while the campus indeed was itself under lockdown conditions. He'll give an overview of the search for a possible vaccine, a subject which has been very much in the news here, uh, which has been very much in the news here, um, uh, particularly in relation to the uh, University of Oxford's announcements from earlier this week. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Noam Stern Ginosar from the Department of Molecular Genetics, um, who will explain how viruses invade healthy cells and take over from a cell's uh, system to survive and reproduce. She'll discuss her research on viral infections and how that's impacting on COVID 19 discoveries. And then moving on to the topics of how we release from lockdown, Professor Uri Alon, uh, who's a leading uh, expert on bioinformatics, will present the science behind a unique pandemic exit strategy, which is known as um, intermittent lockdown, aimed at getting the economy going and the workforce back up and running whilst maintaining minimal risk for the resurgence of the virus. Um, we'd also really like to hear uh, from you, from questions from you. So please do send your questions in, either by putting a comment on social media, or you can email us, and the email address hopefully will appear on the screen. Um, it's uh, hello at the us.tv. Again, hello at the us.tv. You can see that up on the screen now. And that's also a way of getting questions to us. So either send them in via a comment on social media, or to that email address. So I'd now like to move on to the first of our talks. I think uh, all of our speakers know that we've asked them to speak for, for uh, up to 15 minutes. So let's kick off first with Professor Ozeri. Professor, please. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, and thank you all for, uh, for joining us for this, uh, for this seminar. I think that for the Weizmann Institute, it's always extremely important uh, to stay in touch and build bridges with communities in Israel and outside of Israel. And I think that at times like these, the importance of, of these connections is even more pronounced and clear. Uh, so thank you very much for joining in. Let me share my screen. Um, I've never done this on this platform, so let's see. OK, 
Can you see my presentation now? Good. Uh, yes, we've got it. Thank you. So for those of you who um, are unfamiliar with the Weizmann Institute, uh, I'd like to introduce the Weizmann just in a, in a few sentences. We're a scientific research institute a little south of Tel Aviv in Rehovot. Um, we have about 4,500 4, people working, investigating, studying at the Weizmann Institute. We're not a university. We don't have a bachelor's degree, but we do have a graduate school with about 1,500 graduate students, about 250 research group uh, in five different uh, domains of scientific endeavor, biology, biochemistry, chemistry and atmospheric and planetary sciences, physics and math and computer science. And in fact, the Weizmann Institute of Science has a very deep historic connection uh, with the UK. In fact, uh, Chaim Weizmann, who was the first president uh, of Israel, was a scientist. He was a chemist at the University of Manchester. He was a faculty member. Uh, and he was also the leading Zionist, or he led the Zionist diplomacy in the UK, securing, among other things, the Balfour Declaration. Um, so he was very active uh, in the UK. And in fact, when he established the Weizmann Institute, this was uh, after a, a political failure. In fact, he had to leave the leadership of the Zionist movement when he lost an election. Um, he decided to go back to science, establish a scientific institution, and actually got funded for that by the Z family uh, from London, from the UK. And therefore, in 1934, when the Weizmann Institute uh, started, it was called the Zeef Institute. Uh, since then, um, the Weizmann Institute and Weizmann UK have been partners through philanthropy, through connections, making connections with institutions in the UK. Uh, in fact, even today, we have a program called Weizmann UK through which we build collaborations between scientists in at the Weizmann Institute and different universities uh, across the UK. Um, in fact, um, one of our scientists, Roy Avraham, through the Weizmann UK program is collaborating with Andrew Pollard, a professor at Oxford that got uh, much, um, much press uh, and much exposure during uh, the last week due to uh, progress uh, uh, for the COVID, COVID vaccine. So we're very proud about our, our, about our UK connection. So the Weizmann Institute of Science, like any other scientific institution, uh, you know, beginning of this year, we were heavily uh, engaged in scientific research. And um, you know, end of February or so, we realized that the world is about to change. Um, I think we might have realized that even a little bit sooner than other places in Israel. This is due to the fact that many of the scientists or some of the scientists on campus, as well as connections that we have with medical institutions in Israel, were already uh, sufficiently aware and involved in the evolving situation in China and were able to get us, get us heads up. But very soon after the end of February, it was clear that, um, that the coronavirus is changing the world. It's changing the way we do everything. It was changing our ability to be on campus. It was changing our ability to, uh, to travel. Um, and very soon as management, we had to find ways to live uh, and, and perform research with COVID-19. I know that uh, in the UK, it took a little bit of time until lockdown was very present. And when it was present, it was very, as far as I know from colleagues in Oxford and Cambridge, it was pretty much uh, full lockdown. Here, um, we were forced by the state to send 70% of our technical and administrative staff on paid leave. And we had to limit uh, the presence of scientists students, uh, postdocs in the laboratories. So the pace with which science was progressing was much, much slower. On the other hand, this uh, pandemic really uh, portrays the importance of science. And it was very clear from the onset that the way out of this situation is through scientific discoveries 
through vaccines, through drugs, through exit strategies, uh, and so on. So we really had to find the balance between slowing down scientific progress by limiting the number of people on campus, by uh, slowing down our connections with the outside world, balancing that with the need to make very rapid, very efficient progress towards uh, remedies to the, to the COVID virus. Um, so we had to make sure that research continues, that the core facilities that supply research services, which are essential uh, to perform bio the biological and biomedical and chemical and other types of research on campus still goes on. Very quickly, uh, we found out that there were, uh, there were a large number of initiatives on campus of scientists who really stopped their regular research. Uh, you'll hear later from Uri Alon, who doesn't deal usually with pandemics. Uri is a systems biology expert, so I don't think Uri dealt with, with pandemics before, but many other scientists similar to Uri really left all they were doing and focused their talent, focused their energy, and the research group onto trying to find solutions uh, to the COVID-19 situation. Um, I think it, it, it goes without saying that uh, groups like those of Noam Stern Genosar, who is an expert on viruses, groups that are already, were already engaged in biology and chemistry, also turned uh, their focus onto, onto uh, COVID research. The Weizmann Institute of Science is a very, um, you know, it's an institute where science is done bottom up. It's not done, it's not dictated or directed or, um, or navigated by management or from the top. Researchers at the Weizmann Institute follow their curiosity and choose their research following their heart's desire. It was still heartwarming to see that even though we did not direct or nobody directed the, the research done at the Weizmann Institute towards COVID-19 research, very soon, 65 uh, research groups were engaged in COVID-19 research. As I said, we're a research institution of 200, 250 groups. That means that about a quarter of our scientists turned their efforts into COVID-19 research. Uh, we as management uh, made available the tools that can support uh, this research through funding, through infrastructure. Um, what you see here is a poster on a symposium that we held in April um, trying to concentrate all the research on COVID-19 uh, on campuses. And, and as I said, we had 65 different projects. What I'd like to do next is to shortly uh, describe um, the different topics uh, on which people at the Weizmann Institute made progress. So these fall under different categories. One such category is that of testing and diagnostics. Testing is an essential tool, not on, only in order to identify people who carry the disease or through serological tests, people to identify people who have been exposed to the disease and are probably now immune to being reinfected. It's also, besides being a clinical tool, it's also a critical tool for the decision-making uh, uh, level in countries, in organizations, in order to be able to make decisions in order to move towards exit strategies, what the leadership must have is information. And information can be acquired through uh, testing and diagnostics. And progress at the Weizmann Institute towards testing were, was made through different avenues. One avenue was uh, an avenue through which we decided to put the laboratories that we have at the Weizmann Institute, which were, or still are, uh, equipped with state-of-the-art uh, equipment, PCR machines, uh, genetic sequencers, um, as well as expert uh, scientists, and put these uh, scientists and laboratories to the service of the Israeli Ministry of Health and take part um, in the national effort of performing coronavirus tests. It took about two weeks to build, to turn our scientific laboratories into a testing facilities and integrate these testing facilities into the national effort. Now in these laboratories, the protocols that were followed were not identical, but very, very similar to the protocols that were used and still are used by uh, national laboratories of the Department of Health. 
These protocols have bottlenecks. Uh, they, their throughput is limited. Their accuracy is limited. Um, these tests, to a large extent, rely on genetic sequences of small segments of RNA coming from the virus. Um, at the Weizmann Institute, we have several world-leading experts, and their expertise is to really sequence very efficiently and without much error, very long sequences of RNA or DNA. And two of these, um, two of these experts, Rana Rinav and Ido Amit, have developed a completely new technique that will enable, with much less error and a much higher throughput, run uh, RNA sequences of testing on, on, on the population. The other category uh, in which Weizmann scientists uh, made uh, important progress and impact is that of tracking and, and data management. And I think one great example of such a project was led by Iran Segal, who is a professor at our uh, computer science department, but most of his research is actually focused on biology Iran is an expert on taking sophisticating algorithms, sophisticated algorithms and methods that come from the world of computer science and turning those uh, into tools in biology. What Iran did is recognize very, very early on the fact that, uh, that biological tests are, are a scarce resource. You can't run them very quickly. By coming up with uh, questionnaires, Iran was able to survey very quickly get large statistics on the abundance of symptoms in the population and therefore identify, this way identify out, outbreaks of COVID-19 way earlier than the biological tests were able to identify. The third region in which uh, there was large activity at the Weizmann Institute is that of searching for vaccines and drugs. Um, and there are plenty of scientists working uh, along these ways, uh, these avenues, and you'll hear from Noam uh, in a few minutes about her own uh, research. I'm just gonna mention uh, one research here, and that's the research that would, was led by Near London, Professor Near London, um, who is a computational biochemist at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, what Near did is uh, he used his computational tools in order to identify possible small molecules, chemicals, that would adhere to the COVID-19 or one part of the COVID-19 virus and disable its function in order to develop a drug. The unique thing about Nier's research is that he realized that in order to make very rapid progress, that's, that is something that cannot be done alone in his lab. And therefore, he teamed up with two more groups, one in Oxford University, one in Sloan Catering in the US. And they did not sell just for that. What they did is they opened their entire computational platform for an open science type approach and actually invited all medicinal chemists in the world to try and figure out based on their uh, knowledge of the virus structure and the, their computational tools come up with suggestions for molecules. Uh, this Oxford Weizmann Sloan Catering collaboration has now identified several promising um, prospects for drugs and they're hoping to move into uh, clinical trials in animals uh, very soon. Um, I'll move on quickly because I'm uh, pretty much ran out of time. I'll, I'll say very quickly that there are uh, several other approaches, avenues with which we try to attack the COVID pandemic. One is through giving uh, answers to the educational crisis that we have in the world. Many, many kids stuck at home and cannot participate in regular educational activities. And through the Davidson Institute, which is the educational arm of the Weizmann Institute, we came up with an initiative that is now online in four different languages, Hebrew, Arabic, Spanish, and English, which provides scientific uh, content, educational content, content for kids stuck at home with an emphasis on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, with the belief that kids who know more about the disease would experience less anxiety. I'm not gonna say uh, much about exit strategies, but several Weizmann scientists have been engaged in trying to think and engineer smart and sophisticated exit strategies. And Uri Alon here together with Juan Milo came out with a very clever 410 
exit strategies, and Uli is going to tell you about this uh, in a few minutes. Lastly, I'll say uh, that we fear and experts at the Weizmann Institute who work on neurobiology and mental health uh, fear that the next pandemic we'll be facing is that of mental health issues. Uh, this would be fueled by the long uh, time during which people have been socially isolated and locked at home. And again, through questionnaires and research, uh, Alon Chen, who also happens to be the president of the Weizmann Institute, uh, is engaged in research trying to identify these mental outbreaks of mental health uh, problems early before they, they surface up and become uh, very, very obvious. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you um, and give the stage to Dr. Noam Genosar. Noam is one of our um, experts on thank you, uh, research. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ozeri, particularly for sharing the breadth of research and the rate of reaction of scientists to adjust their, their paths from the Institute. So if we can now move on with our next speaker, as Professor Azeri said, we're going to hear from Dr. Stern, Dr. Noam Stern Genasar from the Department of Molecular Genetics, who will share with us how viruses can take over healthy cells. Noam. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon for everyone. Really nice uh, being here with you. So I'll tell you a little bit about viruses and then a little bit about our specific research. So I'll start by a very simple uh, definition. What is a virus? And uh, actually, the meaning of the word virus in Latin means poison. And it was coined by Louis Pasteur uh, a long time ago when he was studying rabies. And he was trying to understand what caused the disease. And what he discovered is that whatever caused the disease, he cannot see it by a microscope. And he cannot filter it by the filter he has. He had in, in these days. And he called this thing a, a poison, a virus. And so he didn't really understand what it is. But this is the, the name the viruses still carry on. And actually, researchers up until today are still debating whether viruses are um, a simple uh, life form or whether it's just a, a complex genetic material. Um, and what viruses do, and that's why they are so harmful or potentially could be harmful, is that they can divide by themselves. But when they infect a cell, they can take over the cell machinery and then the cell just generate now hundreds or even thousands of new viruses. And so the virus just take over the cell and fully depends on the cell in order to divide. Um, so viruses are actually all around us in the world. They are not something unique to human or unique to us. Uh, they infect all organisms, even bacteria have viruses that infect them. And actually, we carry within us hundreds of viruses every day. So not every virus can cause a, a world a pandemic. And this is not something that occurs every day. And our bodies are really well adapted to cope with uh, viral infections. Uh, viruses also uh, are not one thing. We say virus and we imagine this small thing. But they are actually coming in many different flavors and different sizes. So of course, they're all uh, very small, but there are actually uh, thousands of fold difference in relative size of different viruses. Uh, and again, they have also very unique uh, shapes and features under the microscope. So what is a virus? Oh, sorry. No. I'm sorry. So uh, the definition of viruses actually relies on, on two parameters. Uh, one is uh, whether uh, is the, the genetic material it has, whether it's RNA or DNA. And so we divide all the viruses world based on DNA viruses or RNA viruses. So for example, the coronavirus is an RNA virus, whereas uh, for example, herpes viruses are DNA viruses. And then the second division is actually, uh, where, so a, a virus is actually a genetic material that is uh, packed in a protein shell. And 
this protein shell could be the only package of the virus, and then we will call it a non-enveloped virus. And an example for that is a polio virus that can also cause serious disease before we had vaccine. Or it can also have an envelope around it, as you can see here in the example here, and then we call it an enveloped virus. And for example, the coronavirus is an enveloped virus. So the coronavirus is an RNA enveloped virus. And now I'll just go quickly on what happened when a cell meets a coronavirus. And this is what is seen here. So a coronavirus is an enveloped virus. And in its envelope, it has this a unique protein that I'm sure all of you already heard about it. This is the spike protein. And what this protein is, is doing, it can, when it meets a cell, it can recognize a specific receptor and a specific protein on the surface of our cells, which is called ACE2. And this is, we need to remember, this is just a normal human protein that is just uh, expressed or, or sit in, in the surface of many of our cells, and it has its own function, which has nothing to do with viral infection. And so when the coronavirus can recognize this ACE2, it can then inject its RNA into the cell, so the genetic material, and then this RNA is recognized by, by our own machinery, which is called the ribosome. This is the white thing that you see here. And what the ribosome do, they can uh, convert the genetic material of the virus into proteins. And these are all these colorful dots that you are seeing here. And these proteins, these viral proteins, are actually the one that are uh, executing the viral plan and are the ones that will allow the virus to take over the cell. And so what we wanted to ask in, our, in my lab is which proteins exactly are being made from the coronavirus, from the SARS-CoV-2 virus that caused the COVID-19 pandemic. And so what we do, we can take cells and infect them, in this case, with the coronavirus. And then we use a very unique method that allows us to look specifically at the ribosomes, which are the cellular machinery that convert the genetic material into protein. And by looking at the ribosome and what they are actually converting, we can really measure how much each viral protein is being synthesized, it's being made in an infected cell. And so the, the, virus, the virus, as we know, it has 12 uh, proteins that it can encode for. And then if we, using our measurement, we can actually quantify how much of each of these proteins is being made. And this is what you can see here in the different colors. So every color here represents a viral protein. I think what is very obvious is that, the, for example, the yellow protein, which is the nucleocapsid, is really the most abundant viral protein that is being made in an infected cell. And why is this important? So it's important for two things. First, it helps us to better understand how the virus works, how does it take over our cells. Uh, and second, it's actually also very important for diagnostic. So a very important factor uh, in coronavirus research is to really improve the diagnostic because the faster and more accurate we can identify infection, uh, our means to fight the, the disease and the, and the pandemic will be better. And if we'll aim diagnostic to abundant proteins, our sensitivity will really grow. So just knowing which viral proteins are produced and how much can really aid uh, diagnostic efforts. In addition, since we look at the ribosomes themselves, we can actually ask, are there any other viral proteins that are me being made besides the one that were uh, predicted before? And we actually identify several new proteins that are being made. So basically, if we look at the ribosome on, on top of the, the known proteins that were, that were predicted to be made, we identified several new ones. And some of them are really highly conserved, suggesting that they are really critical part of the virus. And the reason this is important is first, uh, it will, having a clear map of which viral proteins are being made will allow us to understand better the uh, mechanism the virus used to take over the cells and basically why is it causing the disease it's causing. Uh, and second, if we have a new protein, this could potentially be new targets for therapeutics that can help us uh, to fight uh, the virus. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, after the next show, I'll be also happy to answer any questions you have.
תודה רבה, באמת מצוין, תודה רבה, 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 If I could, uh, as we move on to our third speaker, if I could just remind everybody that if you want to submit any questions, you can do that by popping something into the comments box on uh, social media, or as you can see on the banner on the screen right now, you can email us at hello at the us.tv. So let's now go on to our, uh, our last speaker, but certainly not least, uh, we're going to hear from Professor Uri Alon. Uri is a leading expert in bioinformatics. He's going to present... Um, some of the science behind Israel's intermittent lockdown strategy. Professor Uri, please. Thank you. Uh, it's exciting to speak with you about cyclic strategies that can suppress COVID-19 and allow economic activity, joint work with Ron Milo, epidemiologists and economists in uh, BGU and Tel Aviv University. So we're in a dilemma in the world, right? There's the economic plague and there's the viral plague. And if we look at the number of cases, we can see that if you do lockdown or measures like that, they can go down. But just as happened in Israel, they can go back up. And this might happen also in Europe, it happening in the United States. And then what do we do? Do we do another lockdown with devastating economic consequences and also maybe take away the hope? People open up their businesses and now they have to close it. And then what, what next after this lockdown? Do we have to... reopen, then another lockdown, and how long will we be stuck in these kind of cycles of lockdown and, and release? So we want to be looking for a way to balance economics and epidemiology. And, and we have a suggestion uh, to prevent this unpredictability, right? We want for the economy to thrive. We want to have some kind of a predictable plan for the long term. where we can go into a routine that helps people understand when they can go to school, when they can open up their shops, et cetera, and, um, and make things predictable. So the idea is a cyclic work cycle where you work for four days and then 10 days of lockdown. And then the next uh, two weeks, you work for four days, 10 days of lockdown. I mean, everybody works and goes to school on the same four days. So and th this uh, is a two-week kind of, repetitive cycle and the reason it works is it exploits the vulnerability of the virus see once you get infected there are about three days where you don't infect other people that's called the latent period and that's a well-known property of the virus so if you get infected at work you spend most of your latent period at work and you only get infected you only get infectious right during lockdown at home and that way you avoid infecting many people You might infect some people at home, but they'll also, in these 10 days, almost go over their infectious cycle. And that is one way to use a kind of an Achilles heel of the virus, which is this three-day latent period, and to time work so that a latent period falls on the work. And another major factor, maybe the most important one, is you're only working four days out of two weeks. You're exposed to many other people only four days. out of 14 of the time, which greatly reduces the, the exposure. So we hit the virus in two different ways. And knowing what we know now about how effective lockdown is and how uh, effective work days can be at stopping the virus, it seems to be a realistic uh, proposal to, that's how you can get four days, work days out of 14 with the ability of European countries to, to have a good lockdown and a, um, and good effectiveness during work days. Um, there's a variant also when you can split the population into two groups. Each one does this 4-10 work cycle, and, but in staggered weeks. And that way you can achieve almost a full uh, economy kind of continu continuation, which with each of these two groups of households working four days and having 10 days of lockdown. And that's very effective for schools, for example. Uh, and that was, in fact, adopted by uh, several school systems in the U.S. and by the Austrian school system, a variant of this. Working in two groups like this also reduces density. Each, each time you only have half the students or half the workers, and half the density also reduces transmission, uh, as was shown also in the, by a group in Barilan, Basel Lab, and so that you get a very strong suppression of the disease. Uh, 
I realize that working four, four days out of 14 is a strong measure and only should be contemplated after we realize, like we do in Israel, that reopening just doesn't work um, well enough or opening some sectors. And so it's quite, quite extreme. But it, it's, it's, its advantages are that you can, you can try it for a while. And if you see that infections are rising, you can always reduce work days. Or if you see the infections keep going down, you can increase work days. So you can kind of uh, tune this to get a, um, a working economy. And we view it as a way to kind of trans transit between this uh, medium term it'll take until we have a, a vaccine or a long-term solution. And um, very importantly, I just want to say that this strategy is designed to suppress the virus. As I say, you have replication number, reproduction number smaller than one, so that even though during work days you have some infections, overall the, the, infect, the epidemic goes away in, in this kind of um, cyclic strategy and can carry us through. And it's, it's um, better than opening, reopening, and uh, you know, it, 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 and then re closing down at unscheduled times, which gives you in the end more cases because the cyclic strategy basically removes the epidemic and you don't need to have to pay the cost of lives, et cetera, with every new lockdown. And it's adaptive and kind of a well thought out scientifically based plan so that it creates trust and confidence it's equitable because on those four days, everybody works. It's not that some sectors do and some sectors don't. And you do have to take a lot of all the measures and precautions like uh, masks and social distancing and avoiding large gatherings. But school, parents can uh, go to work, kids go to school, etc. And it could be used on a scale of a company, a town, and I'll show you it has been used in all these different scales. And because it's not a continuous lockdown, it's easy for uh, people who are working on a cash economy or informal sector to adhere to it. Because realistically, people who, who live on cash can't can't adhere to a long long, a long lockdown. Um, and this was adopted by the Austrian school system and some parts of the German school system, for example. So Austria works on a kind of two groups, which each, each one doing three days of school, one week and two days the other week. That's the official recommendation. Um, Mexico City, 23 million people announced that it's adopting this for Fortin strategy for the entire region. And big companies like MasterCard with tens of thousands of workers in uh, many different countries have adopted this and also a large Spanish engineering company, many other schools, etc. So that it seems to, what we hear is from companies is that it helps alleviate some of the anxiety that workers have about coming back to work because, um, because it's, um, it creates a trust kind of in the, in the, in the program. I just also want to say that this is a, um, and what we hear from people who are trying it, like the Austrian school system, it seems to be working quite well and is quite feasible. But each country or region, if anybody tries to adopt it, you should think about it like a trial period of a month or so and see if cases are rising. You can always tune the, the proportions um, because we really don't understand the psychology of how people react to cyclic lockdown and uh, how behavior affects the virus, etc. So many unknowns that we would counsel giving, viewing it as a trial period and then, um, and then uh, seeing how it works and adapting it. That's, uh, that's the idea. And, um, and it's thrilling to see in just a, a few months how a theoretical idea can translate into policy that affects many people and uh, also a little bit frightening, right? Hopefully, hopefully it'll be... Uh, effective. Uh, in Israel right now, um, we're, we're advising uh, the government and there is some scope that it might be adopted, who knows, because things are quite chaotic here, to think about a plan B, what will happen after a lockdown that unfortunately appears to be looming in Israel after uh, our uh, second wave.
And of course, there's other plans and, and proposals. So um, I'm gonna, I'll stop here and thank you very much for listening. I'd love to hear your questions and comments. I think we may have uh, just uh, lost Prof Professor Alon. Are you still with us? Yes. Uh, sorry, I think we lost your last sentence there. If you just want to uh, to repeat your, your last sentence, I think you just froze for a moment. Yes, thank you. Uh, that I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you, and I'd love to hear your feedback and, and learn from you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so uh, thank you so much for your talk. So important that when we're at a stage where we are only just beginning to see the beginnings of some effective treatments and vaccines are uh, at best a little way off, uh, that we have uh, alternative measures to getting the economy uh, the economies running again. Thank you all for your excellent talks. Uh, we have some questions that have been coming in and some questions that have been um, submitted in uh, su submitted in uh, in, uh, in other ways. Uh, maybe I'll just kick off with one. Um, I might try and direct them, but if I direct them to the wrong person or somebody else feels they know better, please uh, please jump in. The first one is for uh, Dr. Stern Ginosar. Can you say, um, we hear a lot about T cells in, uh, in the press here. Can you say a little bit about what's special about T cells and their role uh, in, uh, in uh, coronavirus and uh, in um, um, uh, treatment? Yeah, so basically when, what's unique about us or about complex organism is that we have a, a immunity or that is a, that has memory, that we can remember what we've seen before. And so when people talk about vaccines, uh, this is exactly relying on this memory. It means that we'll, we'll uh, inject to people something that is similar to the virus, and then our body will learn to recognize it, and then when we'll, be, uh, when we'll encounter the real thing, we'll already be prepared. And this memory is built by two branches, uh, B cells and T cells. And so B cells are the ones that are generating antibodies that everyone talk about. And antibodies are just little proteins, little material that can recognize the virus and like physically block, block it from infecting our cells. And the cells that are making these, these antibodies are B cells. And I think a lot of people are looking at antibodies and B cells. And then the second branch of immunity is T cells, and T cells can also have two roles, one to help the B cells, so if you have good T cells, you'll have good antibodies. And second, there is another route of immunity in that this is the T cells themselves can identify cells that are infected, so cells that get infected with the virus actually put a small flag uh, on the surface saying I'm infected, and then T cells can go and, and kill these cells. So we have antibodies and T cells. Great, thank you. Um, next question's come in via um, social media. Um, again, very topical. It's about testing strategies. Uh, this is a question from uh, Gila Ansel uh, Brunner. Um, she says, uh, and I think I'll uh, ask whichever of you feels happy to answer this to, uh, to have a crack at it. What are your recommendations on testing the wider population? I understand actual figures might only be a third or even a tenth of actual cases. Um, you know, and I think if I'm understanding the last, last point, uh, that, you know, that makes it difficult for people to get tested if they have concerns. So um, is there a view from you in, as we go through this, in many countries, a reopening phase of what sort of testing strategy is needed? Oh, you want to take it? <laughs> I, I can yeah, say, so I think um, the reason a clear answer would really depends on the capacity of the state, right? If you have unlimited testing capacity, then of course we should, you know, test as much as possible. For example, you know, every week in school, you can test kids. Uh, or, you know, in, in places that, you know, uh, bus drivers or uh, hospitals. And so I think it. The answer really depends on what the capacity of the of the country, of the state. There isn't. I think what we should all aim for is much testing as possible, and this, this will allow a much more controlled opening. Is there a um, is there a minimum requirement that people should be thinking about in terms of the availability and pace of testing and results? 
I would like to always go for the numbers. <laughs> you know, it's. I think it's. Uh, it's it's a shock to me how in the 21st century, uh, developed countries like the UK and Israel have not been able to ramp up testing within hours for anyone who wants it any day. This would this only costs let's say, let's call it hundreds of millions or billions of pounds, but the economic cost of lockdown have far exceeded that. We have the technology. It's only a matter of organization. And if you had that, like a pregnancy test, right? Something that gives you almost immediate results. You can, first of all, um, get, you know, see who's, who's uh, infected and isolate them. And second, you don't need to sit 14 days in isolation just for, if you were in contact. You can test and go out of isolation much more quickly. And so it can really help uh, return to normal if we had something as simple as a pregnancy test. And the technology is available. It's a matter of getting organized and putting uh, funds there. And so I believe that's that's a that's a, that's a must for uh, for the for the developed world. I can also add that um, you know for a while and still it, this I think this discuss, this debate still goes on about the, what people refer to as the denominator. In other words. What's the fatality of the disease when you, we know how many people die and we know how many, many people need ventilation devices, but we don't know the actual number of infected people. And the only way to know, and this is a tremendously important question because if this disease, as some people claim, is, you know, it's nothing but a flu with public, public relationship, relations, which means that it's not very fatal and the actual number of people who got infected is much larger than what we think, and only very few people find themselves in, in danger, then you know, the decisions we will make on opening the economy are very different than if we get to the conclusion that you know, one or two percent of people who get infected actually, actually you know, have their life in danger, which means that the only way to, of figuring this out is by performing large surveys. The other place where um, tests are extremely important is in our ability to stop uh, clusters of infections from, from growing rapidly. And the only way you can do that is by very, very quickly testing people who have been in contact with confirmed COVID cases and trying to put them in quarantine as, as fast as possible. So I think you know, the, the capacity of performing high uh, quality, meaning not much false negative or false positives, tests at a large volume and capacity is tremendously important. Thank you, uh, Professor Ozeria. Maybe continuing from there on the point about the denominator, and I'm going to bring in one of the other questions that's come in from uh, Deborah Fraser here, which is about uh, mutation of the, vi the, the virus. Yeah, if I think about, uh, yeah, I'm responsible in part for the Jewish community here in London. Uh, we were hit uh, pretty hard, especially in my, my, my own community here in Mill Hill. We, lo we lost uh, a number of people and it was uh, really hard. Um, the um, equally now, it feels like, but I can't uh, justify this, that uh, there are now very large numbers of infections. It looks like if you're looking at Florida or somewhere like that, hospitals are getting very busy. But there's a question of what are the fatal what are the fatality rates and what's affecting that? Is it because if, the, if it looks like um, the virus is getting less deadly, that's the wrong expression, but just go with me for a second. Is that because it's younger people getting infected? Is it because our treatments are getting better? Is it because the virus is mutating and it's, uh, it's changing? Deborah asked a particular question whether, you know, if she were to get infected by the virus, is that virus the same in her as it would be in somebody else or is it mutating constantly? Who would like a bash at that? So I, I'll, I'll start. We'll Thank go you. the same way. Uh, so I'll start with the easy thing. Coronaviruses are not influenza viruses. They are not um, AIDS. They are not HIV. They are very stable viruses. And there aren't any real mutations. And so the virus is the same virus. And so I think if there are any changes in disease uh, severeness, it stems from the age of the people that get infected. So it's clear that now 
older people are, are much more careful. So on average, I think we have, at least in Israel, but I think it's worldwide, younger people that are getting infected, again, on average. And then it could be that also the weather and humidity are helping a little bit with uh, you know, fighting respiratory disease. But the virus itself is the same virus. It will cause exactly the same disease if it will infect the same individual. Okay, that's that's really very helpful to hear. Anybody want to add to that, or should I uh, move on to to uh, to my next question? So uh, maybe it carries on from there. And I guess the uh, the big question that a lot of people talk about talk about here is in terms of vaccines. Um, you yeah, know, there's a special interest in the UK in the vaccine that's being developed, uh, led by the University of Oxford, but also a different vaccine led by Imperial College uh, in London. Two different technologies, and I think we're all aware that there are now well over a hundred um, candidate uh, candidate vaccines in different stages of uh, of development. It's good to hear that vaccine uh, that mutation isn't the big issue because maybe that gives us hope that if we do find a vaccine, it'll work for a while. But uh, can you give us a sense of what the vac? I don't know whether this is the right words, but what the vaccine race looks like now and. Um, what you see happening over the next 12 months or so from a vaccine perspective. You're smiling at me, Dr. Okay. The other two have a better poker face. So. Okay. So, um, as, as you said, there are hundreds of vaccines that are being developed, and I, I, we can quickly go on the basic strategies. Okay. So, one strategy of a vaccine is to take a virus and basically to kill it. Okay. So, it will be a dead virus, and then you inject it and you get immunity. A second strategy is to uh, engineer a new virus, okay, uh, that will be like a carrier virus, and then you put inside it the spike protein, the, the thing that's really important for the immunity to the coronavirus, and then you uh, stimulate people with this. And then the third route is what everyone is talking about, the Moderna vaccine or the RNA vaccine, where you don't even put the actual protein, but you, took, you, you inject the genetic material itself. And so we have basically company, different company, uh, companies trying each of these routes in many different ways. I think in the UK, you could be really, really happy and optimistic because the last report from the Oxford group looks really, really promising. So the Oxford group used a uh, a template that is based on uh, core viruses uh, to express the spike protein. And they have uh, the first trial published two days ago with 90-something 90, 90 people showing they get really high uh, levels of antibodies uh, that can really potentially prevent, at least have the potential to prevent infection. And so that's what, and, and second, it looks as if there isn't any severe uh, side effects. And so it looks as if the Oxford group uh, uh, is on the right uh, direction. And I think the second, it's not the second, actually the first one, meaning that the, the most advanced group right now is the Moderna in the, in the US, where they're using the genetic material vaccine, the RNA vaccine. Their publication uh, was uh, much smaller in the number, but it seems like they also get uh, like smaller in the number of people they tested, but it seems like they also get an efficient antibody response. So I think globally, we, we can be very optimistic that one, if not very, like I expect actually a few of these groups will achieve efficient vaccines. I think specifically in the UK, you could be really optimistic because I think if, my, if I would put my bets, number one is going to be the Oxford book, but it's a bet. It's not based on anything. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I don't know where to move my investment. Uh, Professor Roy. I would like to add to that that uh, vaccines are an important route towards a solution. A parallel avenue is that of drug discovery. And, you know, if we do, if we have drugs that put people away from danger, even if they got infected by the virus, that's another avenue that would release people and, and the economies, and there's also progress along these lines. So I think overall, within a one-year period, we can be optimistic, but it's not over until until it's over, so. 
absolutely in the announcements in the last weeks or so about dexamethasone and so on just um you know so um amazing particularly when you can reuse an existing drug because don't necessarily need to go through the same level of trials okay mm -hmm. just uh one last question from me and then i'll come back to you if there's anything you want to add before we we finish maybe this one is slightly more left field um not that left field though don't worry um <laughs> maybe uh, maybe it's not such a problem in israel but there's been discussion about the importance of vitamin D. Um, I say not such a problem in Israel because you have lovely sunshine. In fact, it hasn't been so bad here in the UK. But um, the role of um, vitamin D in promoting uh, immunity and whether particularly uh, with coronavirus in mind, but particularly during the fall and uh, winter, uh, that people, whether, whether the evidence looks like people should consider taking vitamin D supplements or whether it's a bit more flaky. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure if this falls under the scientific expertise of any of us. Okay, so. no problem. All right, I'll have to uh, I have to continue my own research into that one. Mm. Um, just before we finish, can I ask you if you have any further, you know, concluding remarks you'd like to make? Those would be very welcome. So. Well, I, I can say that, well, I can thank you again for participating um, and giving us the opportunity to show you a little bit of flavor of the Weizmann Institute, also what the Weizmann Institute is doing in this context. These are, these are challenging times, I think, both in the UK as well as Israel and globally. I think a situation like this emphasizes the importance of, of doing science, of doing basic science and understanding Understanding not just biology, understanding the way the way life happens around us, the way the universe around us evolves, and I think, you know, at, on p at peaceful times, it's very easy to forget the you know the important and dominant role that science has in advancing our life quality, and in protecting our health, and in making our environment cleaner and and healthier, um, and I think. You know, we should keep that in mind. You know, in times of crisis, we remember that very clearly. Um, I hope this crisis is behind us as soon as possible. And I, I hope that the understanding and the, the, the understanding of the value of science would linger on way beyond this, this crisis. So we're, we're better prepared and we're more ready when, when challenges like these um, cross our, our path again. Thank you, uh, Professor Zeri. And the, the scientist uh, uh, in me is just uh, yearning to endorse what you uh, what you just said. You know, these discoveries that are going on now here in, and uh, in, in Israel at the Institute don't just happen. They happen because of years of uh, investments in uh, individuals, in uh, capabilities and, uh, and technologies. And we're benefiting from that now, but it hasn't just suddenly uh, it hasn't just suddenly appeared. Um, I also say it's been a bit of an amazing uh, day for me so far today because um, a little earlier uh, I listened to a presentation to our rabbinate by Professor Chris Whitty, who is our chief medical officer, and uh, his concluding remark was that, you know, ultimately in terms of the way forward, be it treatments or uh, vaccines or uh, ways of returning to work, this is going to be about science coming to the, re coming to the rescue. And we really need you guys. So uh, thank, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Professor Azari, Professor uh, Dr. Stern, Ginnisar, Professor Alon, for your presentations today, which have been incredibly illuminating, but also uh, the discussion that we've just had. I'd also like to say a big thank you to the Weizmann Institute for partnering uh, with the United Synagogue for this event and the, the teams in Israel and uh, the UK that have uh, supported us. Big thank you to uh, Sheraton, Sheraton Gould uh, from uh, Weizmann UK and also to um, our treasurer, but who is also involved in leadership in Whiteman UK, Maxwell Nisner, for helping this event to, uh, to, to happen. Uh, we've got lots more content on our newly launched on-demand television station. So if people that are uh, listening want to see more, please head over to the us.tv. And with that, I thank you all and wish everybody a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.